it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Robert Legfold, Marshall D. Shulman Professor Emeritus in the Department of Political Science at Columbia University. He is the former director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia, the former director of the Soviet Studies Project at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he has been named one of the 500 most influential people in the United States in the field of foreign policy. Dr. Legfold's areas of expertise include foreign policies of Russia, Ukraine, and the other post-Soviet states, U.S. relations with those states, and the impact the region has on international politics in Asia and Europe more broadly. Dr. Legfold has published many insightful works on these and other topics, not least his 2016 book, Return to Cold War, about the souring of U.S.-Russia relations and the possible ways to improve this perilous situation. At present, Dr. Legfold is co-director of the Academy of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences project, Meeting the Challenges of a New Nuclear Age. And he's co-director of the joint Moscow State University, Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MA program, Public Policy in the Post-Soviet Space. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Social Sciences. Please everyone join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Legfold to MSSR 2021. John, thank you. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, an extremely kind introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate being back at the Monterey Summer Symposium with Jarlath beforehand. I was uh, noting that this is uh, the fifth uh, year of, of uh, MSSR, and this is my fifth time at the Monterey Summer Symposium. It's the second time we've done it this way by Zoom, and I'm very sorry that that, uh, that I don't have the chance to meet with you personally and interact outside of these sessions, these Zoom sessions. But I have looked at all of your bios, uh, what you're doing, where you are, uh, and uh, it's all very impressive. So I look forward to our interaction after my opening comments on these three sessions. Uh, I also recognize that we are in very different parts of the world. I know, Sean, you are in the middle of the night now, somewhere in Australia, joining this session. And Nadia, I understand that you're back in Moscow. So it's uh, at this point by my watch, it's 8.18 for you in the evening. And so while others may be drinking coffee, I hope uh, you're finishing your wine at this point. I explain what's behind me. Uh, it's a bit wistful in many ways for me and for you. Uh, I'm coming to you from our place on Cape Cod. I live regularly. I'm not in New York any longer. I've retired from Columbia and we live in New England and Boston. Uh, but we have a place on Cape Cod. I'm on Cape Cod, but that's not Cape Cod behind me. Uh, that's actually Monterey Bay. And if you were in Monterey, that's what you would be able to walk down and see in the, uh, in the evening. Uh, I apologize for using a virtual background, which means that you're going to have to watch me while my hair dances uh, through these comments. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's for today. I'll try to change that by tomorrow. And today, I said what I wanted to discuss with you was the different ways in which people approach the study of Russian foreign policy, because that then leads to very different outcomes in the way in which they see policy. Uh, how you think about Russia and its foreign policy determines what you think of Russia and its foreign policy. And there are many ways of thinking about Russia and its foreign policy. Uh, before thinking, before before talking about some of those frameworks, however, let me introduce uh, a, a critical idea that's normally not featured when we talk about international relations, uh, Russian foreign policy, Russia's relations with the United States, uh, with the West, and otherwise. Uh, and it's a it's a key divide that, as I said a moment ago, I think is is underestimated. Uh, it is the difference between empathy, that is the extent to which you approach your subject with empathy, that is focusing on how those who shape Russian foreign policy understand reality and how they respond to it. Uh, the alternative approach, uh, which I would call non-empathetic, is focusing on the factors shaping Russian foreign policy behavior quite apart from what may be in the minds of Russians uh, in the first case, the emphasis is on subjective reality as an approach to this subject. And the second is so-called objective reality. I rather doubt that there is such a thing, but people uh, tend to make that distinction. I, as I said a moment ago, simply call this divide that between an empathetic approach versus a non-empathetic approach. Uh, and throughout what I have to say, beginning with this point, 
one of the things that I'd encourage you to do is orient yourself. That is, of these different approaches, how, the, how does one versus another resonate more with you? How do you place yourself among them? Uh, and therefore, beginning this the conversation, how do you see yourself as more inclined to think it's important to approach Russian foreign policy or Russia in general with an empathetic approach as opposed to trying to set that aside and be non-empathetic. Both approaches, however, struggle to explain why Russia does what it does in the outside world. Uh, the first is concerned with how and what is much harder to decipher uh, why Russian leaders and elites see the world as they do and why this leads to behavior as it does. The second is more concerned with the unfiltered effects of material factors, such as Russia's power position, its foreign policy resources, military, economic, the demographics that underlie it, the impact of domestic politics uh, and or the nature of the international political system on how Russia behaves uh, as it does. Uh, normally in political science, as many of you who are in that area know, particularly in the, inter in the international relations area, but not just, uh, normally one approach is referred to as ideational and the other is seen as uh, materialist. And again, orient yourself when you think about how you're dealing with the uh, subjects, um, dealing with Russia and if foreign policy is important to you, how you're dealing with foreign policy. On the spectrum of empathy, however, before I leave that subject, there's another critical related element, and that is the role of introspection. Uh, by that, I mean the capacity and the readiness to factor one's own behavior as contributing to or shaping the other side's actions. I believe there's a synergy between the two. The greater the, the readiness to exercise empathy or to feel empathy, more likely is it that, uh, that there will be an introspective approach to one's own behavior. There'll be greater introspection. That from my point of view has been one of the, what's lacking in this instance, uh, uh, the link between empathy and introspection. One of the critical factors in well, the, the new Cold War, John mentioned this book that I had done uh, a year or two ago called Return to Cold War. Uh, and as in the early years of the original Cold War, in this new Cold War, what you see is on both sides, first, a lack of introspection. That is a tendency to blame what's gone wrong, blame the deterioration 99% on the other side. Uh, in social psychology, uh, that's something referred to as a fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error refers to an individual's tendency to attribute another's actions to their character or their personality while, while attributing their own behavior uh, to external situational factors that are outside their control. And the, the uh, effect of the fundamental attribution error obviously constrains a willingness or an ability to put yourself in the other side's shoes. That is empathy. Uh, and as I've said, that has been fundamentally, that was fundamentally a characteristic in the, particularly the early phases of the original Cold War after World War II. And it is a fundamental feature of the current Cold War. Uh, the way in which I put it in the book, when the United States thinks about Russia and Russia thinks about the United States, the essence of the problem, the deteriorated relations, the new Cold War is the essence of the other side, the nature of the other side, not merely uh, conflicting interests, but the character of the other side, the character of the system, the character of its politics. This divide between empathetic and non-empathetic approaches reverberates through the dominant frameworks of analysis that exist. And in the case of each of the frameworks, there are different ways of using the frameworks and those differences produce different conclusions. So again, continue to orient yourself as I uh, as I go forward with, uh, with these comments, uh, these, these, the use different frameworks in, interpreted differently within frameworks generate different truths when it comes to, when it comes to uh, Russian foreign policy. Uh, one uh, one uh, area is comparative politics that tends to stress the domestic factor as a decisive in shaping foreign policy behavior. 
uh, domestic politics, whether it's elite conflict, interest groups, public sentiments, uh, even if it's not precisely public opinion, uh, or regime type. Uh, there are some that argue that Russia is a populist, autocratic, nationalist um, regime type. Stephen Fish out at Berkeley makes that argument. Uh, when then he, he doesn't particularly he doesn't make a particular prediction for foreign policy, but one uh, infers from it uh, a, a regime type of that sort, populist, autocratic, nationalistic, would be jealous in its treatment uh, uh, of how it's how it is treated by others, how it's received by others, churlish in dealing with others, at times aggressive, but not necessarily so. Regime type two, uh, kleptocracy, which is often. Uh, is often ascribed to um, or attributed to or characterized Russia. Karen Dawisha wrote a book uh, by that title. And quite frankly, the Biden administration, uh, that is their fundamental understanding of Russia. As Biden once said, the problem in the US-Russia relationship is a kleptocracy uh, struggling to protect itself. That's what it's all about. Uh, and in this case, in foreign policy terms, the assumption is uh, the, the foreign policy is an effort to preserve a regime, not necessarily to pursue national interests. Foreign policy is a mechanism by which you legitimize a regime, uh, often leads to unscrupulous, uh, unscrupulousness and methods and means and so on. Uh, there's another version along these lines, which is uh, in terms of comparative politics domestic, and that's leadership. I didn't assign it to you, but you well might want to take a look at Michael McFall's piece in International Security in the fall of 2020, where he argues that Russian foreign policy is a matter of choice uh, and that it's a function of the individual leading the ideas of that, the, that individual and the institutions that permit it. It's the issue of agency in, in, uh, in social science, in political science. As McFall puts it, Putin selected a unique trajectory for Russian foreign policy because of a set of particular ideas that he developed about the nature of Russia, the United States, and international relations more broadly. And that choice was a confrontational relationship with the West. Another leader, McFall argues, could have chosen differently, whatever may the broad, be the broader contextual characteristics. And a semi-authoritarian system allowed Putin to choose in that way. Well, there are others along the line. The second kind of framework is historical. Um, Cyril Black, uh, a historian at Princeton, once argued it in one way, patterns in Russian history. John Ledun, another his historian, argued in a very different fashion. So Black, for, for example, argued that over time, over the millennia, Russian foreign policy has been shaped by the struggle to stabilize the empire's borders. Uh, geography was very of little assistance because there were no natural barriers or protective areas or waters along the way. Second, that Russia's often aggressive way of securing its economic interests uh, when at the expense of neighbors uh, stirred a natural apprehension and hostility and characterized relations with surrounding regions. And back to Ivan III in the 15th century, Russia has coveted what it regards as its natural rip, territories that were uh, under once under its sway or at the outset uh, simply inhabited by Slavs. Uh, and that over time, uh, Russian foreign policy has been characterized by generally avoiding long-term alliances, uh, by favoring the status quo, often a conservative status quo, and by generally embracing international institutions such as they were. Now that uh, is not the way one would characterize uh, the Soviet Union, Soviet foreign policy. Well, John, Le John Ledun argues the opposite. He argues that over time, over the centuries, Russian foreign policy is the drive of a core area. Now, this is back to geopolitical theories, the, the theories of 19th century, early 20th century, Alfred McKinder and Alfred Mahan uh, that argued that there was a heartland, the Eurasian heartland, a heartland that extended from basically the Elba to Baikal and whoever dominated or controlled the heartland would control the international system. But in any case, Dunn, Ledun argues that Russian foreign policy is marked by a, a drive to uh, this core area to expand to the edges of the Eurasian heartland that is, has pressed against 
other neighboring core areas, uh, Europe and Asia and elsewhere, not according to any preconceived plan, but as the natural, in his words, product of an accumulation of energy seeking release after the completion of a preliminary stage of state building. And until it was checked, this process or this phenomena, checked by German powers in the West and by the British coastland to the South, creating, a, uh, this went on until then, and that then created a permanent frustration that the empire's natural contours remained incomplete. Uh, throughout, he, he argues that Russian behavior has remained settled and solid in its essence. It regularly, now I'm going to quote him, regularly it sought the destabilization of the frontier by exploiting local opposition. Regularly it worked to incorporate the elites in the contested zones into an imperial ruling elite, and regularly it strove to weaken the other core areas from within. Uh, and there are a number of people who might accept Ladun's notion of the historical perspective on Russian foreign policy to argue whether or not Putin's Russia isn't very much within that uh, within that tradition uh, or within that um, within that pattern. The third approach is the one that you probably know best, and that is IR theory. Uh, and the three dominant theories, at least in North America and Western Europe, realist, uh, neoliberalism, and constructivism. The realist, the, Walt, the, the, the Bill Wolforth, William Wolforth, Steve Waltz, Walter Russell Meads, John Mersheimer of the, re, of the world argue that uh, what really counts in terms of shaping Russian foreign policy, again, it's the materialist approach, again, it is the uh, non-empathetic, uh, is the distribution of power and how much of it you have, that's what's decisive. Uh, an international environment that's anarchic, a self-help system, which produces a struggle for power, that struggle for power can either be fundamentally offensive or it can be fundamentally defensive with different outcomes. And you get very practical, you draw very practical conclusions as a result, as many of you know. In fact, I think you were even assigned this by one of the other uh, well, by one of your other faculty this term, uh, the Mersheimer piece, John Mersheimer and Foreign Affairs on NATO enlargement, uh, which John argues it's simply, uh, NATO enlargement is simply, I mean, his piece was on West, the West is at fault, uh, but on the issue of NATO enlargement, he argued that it's simply geopolitics 101, great powers are always sensitive to potential threats near their home territories. Others argue using this framework, uh, uh, less, uh, less, they draw less benign conclusions. Walter Russell Mead, whom I had you read and for a different reason, argues that the partial restitution of Russian power in the Putin period has led to a revisionist agenda. Then you get the neoliberalist argument, um, one of the major, uh, arc, one of the major um, uh, spokesmen or representatives of that is John Eikenberry at Princeton. Uh, the argument is that institutions, rules, and norms matter, that they mediate the effect of international relations as a raw uh, struggle for power. Uh, the liberal international order in that context matters. It's under attack. It's a topic that I'll come back to in much greater detail on Wednesday. Uh, and in this context, Russia is about gaining voice within the existing order and then manipulating it to suit its needs. It's not about replacing it. Uh, it should not be seen as a full-scale revisionist power, in a way contesting uh, uh, Meade's argument in this case, uh, but rather as a part-time spoiler. Uh, and he applies the same to China. The constructivist approach, uh, Bob English at the University of Southern California, and many others, I, I think in many ways people would put me in this category, argue that states act on the subjective reality that they construct. If the United States believes that China is now an adversary or is becoming an adversary bent on undermining US power and influence, it will act accordingly. China, whether that's accurate or not, China will react in its own fashion and this will create a new so-called objective reality. So for people of this view would argue that the end of the Cold War take an illustration, was very much a product, not merely of these larger uh, phenomena that were under, under, underway within Russia itself politically uh, and in international politics, 
but very much a function of Gorbachev's so-called uh, Novoyo Politicheskoye Myslinia, as you know, and it was a key to ending the Cold War. Uh, there's a fourth there's a fourth aspect in terms of approaching Russian foreign policy. It's not so much a framework of analysis as these others are, uh, as much as it is uh, the, the alternative ways in, in which you go about doing something in terms of the scope of your study. Uh, so there's a, there, there are those that study Russian foreign policy in general, uh, and, and a lot of the work done, particularly by more senior uh, scholars in the field of Russian foreign policy studies in the West and in Russia, is looking at Russian foreign policy in general. And then there are others who become specialists on Russian foreign policy toward specific, specific regions. Uh, you had a good illustration of that in a terrific analyst uh, this morning, Hanna Nota, who is a product of this program, uh, but who is now one of the outstanding specialists in analyzing Russian foreign policy in the context of the Middle East, uh, or maybe if not necessarily regions, but in particular dimensions. Maybe you're more interested in Russian foreign policy in terms of IPE, international political economy, and the economic dimensions of international relations. Or alternatively, because political science departments in the US and to a degree in Europe now uh, do divide in this way into security studies and security. Well, then let me wind up by saying, what difference does all this make? The first point I would make is there's bias in all of it. Uh, it's simply that the nature of the bias is different. It has different sources, often driven, in my view, by the choice that you make of the framework that you're using. Uh, and, and the real criterion that you want to use in this context, in my view, is what approach, which approach among the, the various categories that I've laid out for you uh, does more for you, first of all, in generating insight. Which is more powerful? Which is more compelling? Which provides a more clarifying explanations in your view uh, when you begin deciding where you situate yourself and how you launch yourself as an analyst? So first, which provides more insight? The second part of, of second criteria, uh, or second criterion among the criteria is which uh, provides more accuracy? Uh, and that is, in retrospect, which seem to get closer to the, if not the truth, which seem closer uh, in getting things right. Uh, and that means uh, you as analysts and I as an analyst uh, should, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, reflect on our own work, go back and reassess uh, the, what we've done, how we have uh, judged things because all these judgments are subjective and which uh, hold up over time. I've been at this business for 50 years, so there's a lot of stuff I can look at and a lot of mistakes, misjudgments and poor assessments, or at least assessments that didn't pay off in the end uh, are, are quite evident, but it ought to be part of the way you think about approaching this thing right from the beginning. And then the third criteria, uh, criterion among the criteria is which provides more benefit. Uh, which provides more insight for whatever audience you have in mind, and particular, if that is policy making, which provides for more effective policy. That's the third criterion, more benefit. So the final thing I would say is embrace the consequences of your research. If it has policy implications, doesn't necessarily, but if it has policy implications, develop these and develop, develop them well. I might say that in my experience in teaching, uh, when uh, students are in a course where it's appropriate and they're writing papers, uh, and they're writing papers that, uh, as I'm sure many of you are, given the interest that I see that you have, uh, are, uh, have policy implications, and the assignment is for you to develop those policy implications, that's the part of the paper that's more normally given short shrift. People don't spend a lot of time thinking about the policy implications. They spend far more time developing the analysis, which needs to be good, uh, but developing foreign policy prescriptions, if that's appropriate to the project, what you're working on, is something that needs to be dealt with just as carefully as the hard work you do in developing the analysis, doing the research and preparing the paper. And then don't fear to predict. 
at least the range of possible outcomes of your work. Uh, in my view, in our field, uh, in social science in general, the failure is not in uh, the failure to predict an outcome. That can't always be and probably shouldn't be expected, but the failure to recognize the range of possible outcomes. So as we go into this conversation, this discussion now, I'm done with my opening comments. Uh, the question I put to you is, where do you situate yourself? 